Welcome to Cambridge Forum with Neil Ferguson discussing the West and China divergence and convergence. I'm Richard Cooper, an economist who teaches at Harvard University. Neil Ferguson is the Lawrence Tisch Professor of History at Harvard, and he would be the first to tell you that he is not an expert on China. He does, however, have a way of taking on big and important topics in international history, warfare, empire, economic development. His best-selling history of the rise and fall of the British Empire uh, became a classic in the post-9-11 period, a discourse on the nature of the American imperial project. It was mostly on the British Empire, but he could not resist making generalizations about other uh, recent and would-be empires in the world. He followed that with another book, Colossus, The Rise and Fall of the American Empire, and most recently, The War of the World, which has just come out in paperback. There's a flyer out back that you can take, and it's a strikingly original reinterpretation of the 20th century, the bloodiest century in human history. Uh, Neil has written about China. Uh, there was a nice piece in the New York Times Sunday Magazine a year ago, June, uh, China's presence is pervasive in the United States today, and uh, although we don't see it in Cambridge, it's also increasingly pervasive in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, and China's economic emergence is reshaping traditional Western economic expectations. Neil Ferguson is here to explore the, for us the ways that China is reshaping the global economy and along with it, our Western economic future. Neil, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed, Richard. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to hear my inexpert thoughts on China and the historical significance of China's resurgence, which seems to me something about which I can offer inexpert, but I hope interesting thoughts. I was recently lucky to attend the opening of an exhibition in London uh, of some of the terracotta warriors buried in the enormous tomb created for the first emperor of China, the emperor Qin Shi Huangdi, who forged the Middle Kingdom into something resembling its modern form as long ago as 221 years before the birth of Christ. It's a quite extraordinary uh, exhibition. I hope that it will come to the United States. And it was impossible not to be profoundly impressed by not merely the beauty and, and the workmanship of the terracotta warriors, but also the many evidences in that exhibition of China's remarkable sophistication uh, all those two millennia ago. And I found myself wondering if part of the point of sending these remarkable uh, relics all the way to London was gently to remind the British that in the empire game, uh, they were latecomers, and China has been at it for many, many more centuries and at it successfully. If you take the long sweep of Chinese history, it's impossible not to be impressed by the calamitous relative decline that China experienced from around 1600 or 1700 uh, until as recently as the 1960s and 1970s. Let me try to capture this arc of decline with a very simple uh, rough and ready calculation that another economic historian, uh, Angus Madison, allows us to make. Roughly speaking, per capita income in the United States, or what was to become the United States, and in China, was similar in around 1600, uh, perhaps still similar uh, in 1700. The ratio was roughly one to one. By 1950, the ratio of American to Chinese per capita income was at least 22 to 1, 
and very probably twice that ratio because those calculations are based on purchasing power parity and almost certainly exaggerate uh, China's income in international terms. One way of understanding our times, ladies and gentlemen, and by our times I mean our lifetimes, and even a part of our lifetimes, the period since, let us say, 1979, is of a, an extraordinary resurgence of a China that had been in steep relative decline for two or three centuries, a decline that perhaps reached its nadir in the mid-20th century. Since the economic reforms initiated by Deng Xiaoping in 1978, uh, symbolized by his historic visit to the United States the following year, an extraordinary economic miracle has happened. Though from a historian's point of view, it represents a return to a period before 1600, when China was in economic and civilizational terms the equal of Western societies. A fifth of humanity is on the march economically. China's economic growth rate averages, if official statistics are to be believed, 10% a year. Since 1978, China's gross domestic product has increased by a factor of 10. And this is uh, a recovery from economic eclipse based in substantial measure on exports to the rest of the world, exports of manufacturers, the manufacturers that doubtless you all have in your homes, if not in your pockets. And the result of this export-led growth is what economists often refer to as an imbalance. When economists talk about global imbalances, they really mean an imbalance singular. And it's the imbalance represented on the one side by China's burgeoning uh, trade surplus, and then the other side by the even larger deficit in the current account uh, of the United States. China's current account surplus is projected to rise to $380 billion. That's roughly 12% of China's GDP in the foreseeable future. And that has profound implications for this country. Because, of course, as you're doubtless aware, the United States is China's biggest trading partner, uh, unless you count the European Union as a single entity. It accounts for nearly 20% of China's total exports. And on current trends, the trade surplus that China runs with the US alone could very soon reach $260 billion. The trajectory is so breathtaking that within a matter of years, China could overtake the United States as an exporter. Indeed, it may well happen this year. And it could overtake the United States as a producer, in other words, in terms of gross domestic product, as soon as 2027, just 20 years from now. So the effect is to close with extraordinary speed that gap that opened up between Chinese and Western living standards in the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries. If you work out that ratio I mentioned earlier, uh, of American to Chinese uh, per capita GDP, just to, to work out how much richer the average American is than the average Chinese. In current dollar terms, that ratio is still quite strikingly high. It's still in the region of 23 to 1. But on current projections, and I have this on the authority uh, of Goldman Sachs, the all-wise investment bankers, uh, that ratio could contract to as little as 6 to 1 by 2025 and as little as 3 to 1 by 2050. Not, you'll notice, complete parity. Even by 2050, the average American could still be three times richer than the average Chinese, but that's an awful lot better than 22 or 23 times richer. Now, the big question that has brought uh, at least some of you into this cavernous hall this evening is whether this matters whether Americans should be worried by what is often referred to as China's quiet rise. Quiet it may be, but it is spectacular in economic terms. Indeed, it's hard to think of an economic turnaround to compare with this. 
even Japan's post-1945 economic miracle uh, somehow uh, pales into insignificance alongside these extraordinary numbers. And there are many politicians uh, and others, commentators and the like, who would say that this poses a profound problem and that as China rises quietly on the basis of exporting manufacturers to the United States, there is an inexorable uh, hollowing out of the U.S. economy. Uh, the proverbial sucking sound uh, we're told we hear is the sound of American manufacturing jobs uh, being transported uh, to Asia as a result of Chinese competition. Now, I'm sure my esteemed colleague, Richard Cooper, has thoughts on this issue, and we'll get back to it in the discussion. But before we talk about the employment implications uh, of Chinese competition, let's just reflect uh, on the broader picture of what seems to me to be an extraordinary symbiotic relationship between China and America. So close are these relationships uh, in terms not just of exports, but also in terms of capital flows, uh, that I recently uh, wrote a paper that referred to a single economy that was emerging as the dominant force uh, in the world, the economy of chai America. Think of China and America, of the People's Republic of China and the United States of America, as operating as one integrated economy. And I think you will begin to understand better the implications of China's quiet rise. Chimerica is an amazing place. It accounts for, by my calculations, 13% of the world's land surface, more than a quarter of its population, and a third of the world's economic output. Perhaps even more impressively, Chimerica has accounted for 60% of global economic growth over the past five years or so. So this is really quite an astonishing phenomenon. And what happens uh, in Chimerica is really very remarkable. Americans get much cheaper imported manufacturers than they could possibly produce by themselves. And until very recently, one of the things that has driven inflation down uh, in the world inexorably has been the dramatic productivity gains achieved uh, by Chinese manufacturing. So from one point of view, there's an obvious benefit. Life uh, has got cheaper if measured in flat screens uh, or laptops uh, or indeed uh, in terms of the cost of cell phones. But at the same time, uh, the benefits of Chimerica have uh, included not just lower prices, but lower interest rates. An extraordinary thing has happened, perhaps a good illustration of the law of unintended consequences. In order to ensure that China never experienced what much of Asia experienced in 1997-98, uh, Chinese monetary authorities have systematically intervened in foreign currency markets to keep their currency relatively cheap against the dollar and therefore to keep their exports relatively cheap in the eyes of American consumers. And this intervention has led to a huge accumulation of dollars in the reserves of the People's Bank of China roughly 1 to 1.3 trillion worth uh, of dollars and dollar-denominated assets. If it hadn't been for these Chinese purchases, long-term interest rates in the United States would certainly have risen higher than they have been in the last several years. Economists disagree by how much, but it seems fair to say that at least 100 basis points, at least 1%, uh, is involved. And much that we've seen in recent years has been driven by this extraordinary uh, combination uh, of cheap manufacturers, but also relatively low interest rates. At the same time, the news just keeps getting better. American corporations have enjoyed historically extraordinary profitability in recent years. And one of the reasons, again, is China. If you want to ask why corporations have been so profitable, just look at the S&P 500. Uh, one of the reasons has been that they have been enjoying the benefits of inexpensive Chinese labor. Outsourcing is profitable for Ameri American corporations. That's why they do it. Now, this is a very remarkable conjunction economically. Relatively low interest rates, indeed low real interest rates, as a result of Chinese savings being channeled through the central bank into the U U.S. capital market, 
uh, and at the same time, a buoyant corporate profitability. Chimerica has been an extremely uh, happy place to, to be, particularly for those involved in financial services. It has been quite hard until recently to lose money under these circumstances. The question really that seems to me important, therefore, has nothing much to do with whether Americans should be engaged in manufacturing industry, because the long-term trend is clearly against that. It's extremely hard to envisage a future in which American manufacturing industry ever regains the heights uh, that it still uh, enjoyed in the 1970s and 1980s. This is an inexorable transfer uh, of manufacturing activity to Asia. That's not the question. The question, ladies and gentlemen, is whether Chimerica, that symbiotic relationship between the United States and China, could at some point, in some way, fall apart. And I want to offer you some thoughts as to what threats might exist to the stability uh, of Chimerica. One obvious one is protectionism. This game begins to break down if the U.S. Congress is no longer prepared to play by the rules of Chimerica. If uh, politically enterprising congressmen and senators seeking re-election see a way of uh, enhancing their chances by China bashing the way their predecessors in the 1980s, Japan bashed, accusing China of currency manipulation, calling for some kind of protection for at least some sectors of the U.S. economy is a sure way to destabilize the China-America relationship. And there are other scenarios it's easy to think of. Another would be that China might begin to lose its insatiable appetite for U.S. dollars. There seems to be a limit to how many uh, dollars any central bank can reasonably hold uh, in its reserves. Nobody knows what that limit is, uh, but it's clearly uh, uh, out there somewhere. And there comes a point when the number of dollars being produced uh, by the relatively relaxed monetary policy of the Federal Reserve exceeds the number that China's monetary authorities are prepared to absorb. So there are economic scenarios in which Chimerica could break down, so to speak, from the Chinese side. And we might worry also about the possibility that already deflationary benefit uh, of Chinese exports is, is fading. Chinese export prices have been consistently falling until now. And in the last few months, we've actually seen for the first time inflation in the price of Chinese manufacture. So perhaps the American sweet spot is passing. However, I don't think those are the real worries that we should focus on. This evening, I want to raise just four issues, four problems that seem to me to be inherent in China's quiet rise. Problems which ultimately could jeopardize it, uh, could punctuate, indeed, China's rise with another of those crises that have characterized, well, the rise of nearly all the Asian economies uh, since the rise of Japan in the 1950s. The first question I want to raise is how far any economy can achieve sustained and sustainable economic growth in the absence of certain institutions that have proved highly effective uh, as a basis for growth in the West. And those institutions are private property rights secured by the rule of law and representative institutions which constrain the executive. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that this is a communist-led, state-directed dash for industrial growth. And we've seen such things before, and their outcomes were not necessarily happy. Ladies and gentlemen, every time I hear someone say, I've seen the future and it works, having visited Shanghai, and perhaps you've had this experience, I'm struck by the things that impress them. The cranes, the construction, building three new Manhattans every six months. It's interesting to an historian to hear this kind of enthusiasm for state-led industrialization because Western observers said much the same thing about Stalin's Moscow in the early 1930s. I've seen the future and it works. The cranes, the tall buildings, the construction. I think there's a cause uh, for skepticism when one hears judgments passed about economic performance on the basis of spectacular construction work. So my first question is one that's absolutely fundamental to what has been known for some time as the new institutional economics. If China succeeds on this basis without clearly defined uh, property rights uh, and a rule of law as we understand it 
uh, in the English-speaking world. If China succeeds without representative institutions, with a one-party state, and what are clearly still high levels uh, of corruption uh, at the regional level, then many important theories that have been uh, enunciated by thinkers far more uh, profound than me will be wrong. And a great many books that have been prescribed as readings here at Harvard will have to be pulped. My second question has to do, do with demographics. China is, of course, the world's most popular country, but it won't stay that way. As a consequence of the one-child policy, uh, population growth in China over the next 25 uh, years or 50 years will be relatively low as compared, say, with India, much less uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Indeed, the population of the United States will grow faster than that of China uh, in the next 45 years or so. Uh, and one consequence of this slowdown in population growth is that China's population will age in much the way that European uh, populations are already aging. Currently, fewer than 8% of, of China's population are 65 or over. But by 2050, that proportion could have risen as high as 24%. The third thing that could trip up China, and indeed Chimerica, is the environment. There was recently an excellent article in the journal Foreign Affairs entitled The Great Leap Backward that focused on some of the environmental consequences of breakneck industrialization. And again, if anybody uh, in the audience uh, has visited China, they will be aware uh, that this is not a fresh air society, uh, that on the contrary, levels of uh, air pollution are becoming really quite intolerable uh, in some Chinese cities. And that's not all. Even more alarming is the extraordinary pollution of China's water supply that seems to be a direct consequence of breakneck industrialization. According to one estimate, China's water supply is now so polluted that it kills at least 400,000 people a year. This goes back to my earlier point, ladies and gentlemen. If you have industrialization without private property rights that are clearly defined, it's very hard to stop uh, firms from polluting. Uh, whose field is it that's being polluted? Whose rights are being violated uh, when the river is filled with toxic waste? The tragedy of the commons is an extremely important concept in economics. The notion that common land is most likely to be overgrazed than private land was a central idea uh, in the history of English agriculture. Well, perhaps we're seeing here an absolutely vast uh, uh, example of the tragedy of the commons. And the consequences extend beyond China's borders. Uh, so profound are the environmental consequences uh, of China's industrial policy. You can inhale particles uh, of toxic waste produced in China by wandering through the streets of Los Angeles already. Let me offer one last concluding thought, one last potential uh, problem for Chimerica. It's the old problem, uh, the proverbial snake in the garden of, uh, of Eden, of, of geopolitical conflict. China, as I tried to suggest earlier, is and long has been an empire and it's clear that China's leaders uh, think in terms of imperial power uh, without uh, any real embarrassment. That was obvious in a recent television series that went out in China uh, on the rise of great powers, some of which uh, I was lucky enough to watch. Uh, a fascinating exercise in what European powers did right uh, after around 1500 that China did wrong. And the lessons that emerge from that series are clear. You need to have a very strong navy. Maritime power is imperial power. Uh, and you need to maintain unity at home. If those are the lessons uh, from history that China's leaders draw, it seems to me to create a potential collision course uh, between China and the United States, particularly when it comes to the increasingly scarce raw materials that all developed societies crave. We're seeing a scramble for Africa, the like of which there hasn't been since the late 19th century, except that only one empire is scrambling at the moment, and that empire is China, which currently accounts for a huge proportion of the Sudanese uh, oil exports. China's relationship with Africa isn't encumbered by notions of human rights protection that increasingly play a part in American foreign policy. It's worth also uh, remembering that there is a potential flashpoint at the very heart of relations between China and the United States, and it's Taiwan. It's funny to think back 100 years to a time when another empire was challenging another English-speaking empire uh, for global hegemony. 
In economic terms, Britain and Germany before 1914 seemed to be in a symbiotic relationship in terms of trade, in terms of capital flows, in all kinds of ways. So much so that Norman Angel wrote a book, The Great Illusion, published in 1911, saying there would never be a war between these great powers because it made no economic sense. And yet there was, over a little country, Belgium, which both sides had pledged by treaty uh, to respect as a neutral state. Well, commitments by the United States to Taiwan remind me of Britain's commitments to Belgium uh, in 1914. They don't seem important now, but they could seem hugely important were there to be a showdown between China and Taiwan in the foreseeable future, say, just after the Olympic Games. So, ladies and gentlemen, while I contemplate Chi-America, the relationship between China and the United States, and on the one hand, I'm deeply impressed at its economic benefits. Corporate profitability soars, real interest rates are low, inflation is held in check. The benefits are manifest, and worrying about the loss of manufacturing jobs in Dearborn is really the last thing that we should be doing. On the other hand, and here I'll conclude, when I contemplate the institutional problems of China's breakneck industrialization, the demographic problems that lie ahead, the environmental cataclysm that is unfolding uh, in the Far East, and finally, the potential for geopolitical trouble. I must say, ladies and gentlemen, I become a good deal more pessimistic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, just to remind you, jo you're joining us at the Cambridge Forum, listening to Neil Ferguson discussing the West and China, divergence and convergence. I listened, as I'm sure you did, to Neil with uh, great interest. Uh, I uh, started to make a list of my quarrels with what he was saying, and I will mention a couple, but uh, some of my quarrels were undone in his final remarks because he moved from excessive optimism about China in the future uh, to uh, cautious pessimism about uh, China in the future. Uh, he, he said, for example, citing I'm not sure whom, that in 2027, China's gross domestic product would overtake that of the United States. And let me just say there's no way in which that's going to happen unless there is a catastrophe in the United States of a type that neither I nor anyone else I know foresees during the next uh, two decades. He talked about imbalance singular uh, rather than plural, but I need to remind you and uh, the, our radio audience that there are several other very large surpluses in the world, most notably the oil exporting countries, OPEC, Russia, Norway. Japan still runs a very large surplus. Uh, Central Europe, uh, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland run very large surpluses. So China is not the only country in the world with a large surplus. This talk, however, is about China, but we need to keep in mind that there are very important other parts of the world uh, involved. Finally, uh, Neil suggested that uh, manufacturing was not in the future of the United States. And he used the term hollowing out of the United States. There is a, what for many people is a paradox, for me with uh, something of an agricultural background, uh, no paradox in what, what is happening uh, to manufacturing in the United States because it's the same thing that ha happened in agriculture half a century ago. Output continues to rise year after year after year, goes down in recessions a little bit, but then it recovers and comes back. Our manufacturing output is at least twice what it was 20 years ago in the United States. What is declining is manufacturing employment. And of course, that is important for the people who are employed in manufacturing. Uh, with an agricultural background, and some of you may have the same, the same phenomenon occurred. We now produced huge agricultural surpluses with 2% of the labor force. It is, in human welfare terms, a fantastic achievement and I see manufacturing following agriculture in this regard. And the difference, of course, between employment and output is productivity. And productivity has just uh, risen extraordinarily in U.S. manufacturing. And I do not see that going away in the next decade or in the next two decades. 
uh, there's plenty of room both for a rapid growth of uh, manufacturing in China, uh, which is a, a quite a different character than manufacturing in the United States, which continues to thrive, although manufacturing employment in the United States has declined for two decades and on my reckoning will continue to decline because of the continued growth in, in productivity in the United States. So, But these are uh, small differences, and you didn't come here to hear me. You came here to hear Neil Ferguson. And I would like, therefore, to turn to the audience and ask if any of you has questions that you would like to put. And please come to the microphone here, both so you can be heard uh, by others in the room and so it's adequately recorded. Sir. Yeah, Professor Ferguson, you stated the benefit the Europe had of a large Navy in terms of securing its growth. Um, one theory I've bandied about is that these huge dollar reserves for China function as its Navy. You know, in other words, it has that power to hurt the United States without firing a shot and therefore is deliberately running these large surpluses in order to accumulate this power beyond any what we might term economic motivation. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, thanks for that uh, question. It's, it's worth bearing in mind that, that China has a real navy, uh, too, and that that navy is growing quite rapidly uh, with considerable investment, for example, in uh, uh, new submarines uh, going on more or less unremarked on. I can't remember the last time I read a story about China's navy uh, in the New York Times uh, or any other American newspaper. But the question you raise is one that's uh, been pondered widely. Uh, our former president here at Harvard, Larry Summers, uh, not so long ago raised the question of whether China would be able to do uh, to the United States what the United States had done to Britain during the Suez Crisis, namely to use its financial leverage uh, to force a change in foreign policy. Other commentators have speculated on the kind of conversation that might take place uh, if there were to be a dispute between China uh, and the United States, say, over Taiwan. Uh, the, the question essentially being, at what point do you want the dollar uh, to touch bottom? Uh, where do you want long-term interest rates to rise to before you'll change your mind about this, Mr. President? The problem about this argument seems to me to be that it's a costly strategy uh, for China to threaten to devalue its own uh, currency reserves. Uh, that the hit as a percentage of GDP to China would be quite a substantial one uh, if China were to abandon uh, what amounts to uh, a campaign of systematic intervention uh, uh, to, to acquire dollars. Uh, and so this would be an expensive uh, act of brinkmanship. Uh, one must almost always bear in mind that the United States is still an awful lot bigger uh, uh, economically uh, than China. And, and that, that matters because, as Dick rightly said, uh, it, only in a very rosy scenario does that, that gap disappear. Uh, 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 Richard Cooper asked who's projection it was that China would catch up with the U.S. by 2027. I think it was uh, Jim O'Neill at Goldman Sachs who constructed that particular projection. And I'm never tired of saying that's not how history works. Uh, there aren't these beautiful linear convergence stories. Uh, if you just go back and look at Japan and Britain, and a good analogy actually from 100 years ago, it's true that Japan did catch up with Britain, but it wasn't a slow uh, and painless process. Uh, it was characterized by a huge disruption uh, in the mid-20th century when, of course, these powers came into conflict. So my sense is that China has less leverage, actually, in threatening to dump dollars uh, or allow American interest rates to rise than the U.S. had over Britain uh, in the 1950s. Britain in the 1950s was much weaker economically uh, than the United States is today and a good deal more overstretched imperially. Uh, so although I like the idea, I'm not sure the analogy is a perfect one. And I think the United States would be able to do as it's done in the past and say, uh, it's our dollar, but it's your problem. That line still holds good today. Yes, sir. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk very much, but I, didn't, I felt compelled to challenge one, uh, one absurd platitude that, that you uh, made, which is frequently made in public forums in this country, in talking about China's economic activity in Africa, you said that 
using Sudan and mentioning Sudan, you said that China was not uh, hindered by concerns about human rights, uh, and the implicit contrast being with the United States, which supposedly is concerned about such issues. Um, if you look at uh, uh, U.S. involvement with Saudi Arabia, uh, as a prime example, one of the worst human rights abuses in the world, you would have to see that there's absolutely no basis for drawing any distinctions between the United States and China in terms of the extent to which uh, either of them would let human rights issues get in the way of vital economic interests. And it's just sheer hypocrisy for you or for any spokesperson to claim that the United States holds to a higher standards of human rights. It's just ridiculous. Well, I always love to be accused of absurdity. A mark at the end of that remark, but you can interpret it as a question. I heard. I heard. Please, please, please ask questions, make rather than making little statements. I didn't hear a question. I, I, I didn't hear question marks, but I certainly heard exclamation marks. The uh, uh, terms of like absurd platitude and, and hypocrisy are, are always a little hard to to stomach, but uh, fortunately. I've been uh, blessed with a fair amount of sang froid. Uh, my uh, point was not that the United States uh, behaves in uh, a morally superior way. Uh, that would be an extremely hard argument to make, uh, particularly in view of uh, recent events in the Middle East and indeed in view of longer term trends in other parts of the world during the Cold War. Uh, my point was simply that China is more aggressively pursuing uh, an imperial strategy in Africa uh, than other countries, not only the United States, but also Europe. Uh, and really this is quite important when you consider uh, that there aren't really that many marginal producers of fossil fuels out there. Uh, I, I think of it like this, sir. Uh, empires are not generally much concerned with human rights, although periodically they have moral spasms and decide to abolish slavery to give just one example. But primarily, empires are concerned with the acquisition uh, of natural resources at a price below what they uh, can be acquired for in the open market. Uh, and the fundamental Chinese calculation in investing in infrastructure to connect uh, Central Africa uh, to the coasts, uh, in investing heavily uh, in uh, a country like Sudan, is to ensure that supplies of marginal uh, commodities will be available to China uh, more cheaply than would otherwise be the case uh, in an open market or in a market dominated by another empire. That is the motivation. And it seems to me that uh, with respect to Sudan, uh, there is a certain uh, inability on the part of policymakers uh, in the West to appreciate that there are very high economic stakes uh, to be played for here. Uh, I would be more impressed by Western policy towards uh, uh, Sudan if anything were actually being achieved uh, by the hand-wringing that periodically goes on. Uh, but patently, nothing is being done to stop uh, the genocide uh, that's being perpetrated in Darfur. Uh, so I think you may have misconstrued my remarks. Uh, the one thing I'm extremely uh, careful to avoid is, uh, is a platitude. In fact, an absence of platitude is one of the defining characteristics uh, of my work. Uh, but hypocrisy is a more interesting concept because it seems to me that most imperial... Uh, projects uh, depend on hypocrisy uh, for the legis legitimacy. And indeed, uh, the term organized hypocrisy has been used uh, more than once to explain exactly how it is that English speaking power is wielded. Perhaps it's time for a question. Probably not the one you want to hear, but uh, <clears throat> speaking of uh, pessimistic and collision course, uh, you wrote an article in the Telegraph a couple of years ago that. Uh, had a bearing on China. It's called The Origins of the Great War of 2007 and how it could have been prevented, in which you said, are we living through the origins of the next world war? Certainly it's easy to imagine how a future historian might deal with the next phase of events in the Middle East. Uh, strikes in Iran were urged on President Bush by new conservative commentators throughout 2006, but the president instead was advised to opt for diplomacy. Thanks to China's veto, however, the UN produced nothing but empty resolutions and empty sanctions. Only one man might have stiffened President Bush's resolve in the crisis, the real Sharon, that he had been struck down by a stroke. The optimists argued the Cuban Missile Crisis would repeat itself and both sides would blink, but it was not to be. The devastating nuclear exchange of August 2007 represented not only the failure of diplomacy, it marked the end 
of the Oil Age. Some even said it marked the twilight of the West. As the conflict spread and the Chinese threatened to intervene on the side of Tehran, yet the historian is bound to ask whether or not the true significance of the 2000-2011 war was uh, to vindicate the Bush administration's original principle of preemption. Well, obviously none of that came through. August of 2007 came and went. However, the doctrine of preemption uh, is still around. Uh, so do you and your fellow Anglo-American imperialist jihadists uh, reserve the right not only to launch a, another preemptive attack on Iran, but also perhaps uh, on one of Iran's potential allies like China in the future, if uh, you so see fit? Uh, that's uh, very nice of you to quote from uh, that article, uh, well, though it's unfortunate. Laughing, yeah, go ahead. It's unfortunate that you missed the irony, uh, which is, of course, central to its effect. Uh, the piece was supposed to uh, make clear uh, how easy it is now uh, to pass judgment on foreign policy without any sense of how things will look uh, to historians in the future. Of course, the future is a term we should use with great caution. There is, in fact, no such thing as the future. There are only futures, multiple futures, uh, and they extend before us in an almost infinite number. Uh, and our difficulty is to try to choose from these futures. Uh, it seems to me that the point of that piece was not to be prophetic. At no point in my career have I ever said that historians have the power of prophecy. Rather, what historians can do is show what possible futures lie ahead. Now, I have to point out to you two things. One, uh, it is October 2007. Uh, the year is not over. And although I ironically identified August as the date of uh, reckoning, uh, that was only to make, please, that was only to make uh, the allusion to 1914 complete. It doesn't actually alter the plausibility that at some point in the relatively near future, there could be uh, some kind of confrontation uh, in the Middle East between Iran and Israel. Of course, the time frame is hard to gauge because nobody entirely knows how far advanced the Iranian nuclear program is. But what is clear is that if we simply allow uh, Iran to become a nuclear power, uh, as Israel already is, uh, if we allow also uh, the creation of a nuclear Japan, which is a very likely scenario uh, in the near term, the world is creating a quite different state of affairs than existed in the Cold War. Instead of there simply being two nuclear powers, we end up with multiple pairs of nuclear powers. And that significantly raises the risk of a miscalculation and a nuclear exchange. This is a serious issue. And nobody can pretend uh, that simply sitting by and waiting uh, for nuclear proliferation uh, to become a truly global phenomenon is a good policy. However, I want to make it clear, because you've somewhat misrepresented me, sir, that at no point have I argued for airstrikes uh, against uh, Iran. On the contrary, if you were a regular reader of my newspaper column, uh, you would have come across an article written not very long after that in which I very clearly argued that it would not be in the interest of the United States, that it might well be in the interests of the Iranian president for the US uh, uh, at this point uh, to attack Iranian facilities. So thank you for reading that piece, but perhaps you might read the others that I write too. All right, well, you flip-flop quite a bit, and that's just another example. Well, it, it seems to me also important to explain a, a point about preemption, which is not generally well understood by those who engage in, in facile criticism. The difficulty with the doctrine of preemption, which was there from the very outset uh, of the publication of the National Security Strategy uh, in 2002, is that unlike a policy of retaliation, it's very hard to know if it's worked. Uh, and in many ways, the great difficulty that uh, has bedeviled President Bush is that embarking on this course almost condemns him uh, to unpopularity. Uh, even if it's the case that preemption uh, has achieved something, nobody can be quite sure, not even President Bush himself can be sure, that his policies have done anything to reduce the risk uh, of another 9-11. Another 9-11 hasn't happened. Uh, and yet no credit at all seems to go to the President for this. That's the if you like, the irony uh, of preemption as a doctrine, and that's why the next president will very probably abandon that principle as a basis for American foreign policy. Another question, sir. Well, uh, I didn't mean for this to be a softball, but um, I was wondering if the 
if there could, if you felt that there could be a lead into democratization due to the economic growth and international integration that China is experiencing now? Well, that is the big question, which is extremely hard to answer. At one side, we have a discernible historic trend. There are many, many more democracies in the world today than there were 100 years ago. A majority of the world's people now live under democracy. This is an incontestable advance. And it's hard to believe that there can be an insuperable holdout uh, in the world's most popular, populous country. On the other hand, one of the lessons of 20th century history is that this is not a smooth advance and that one party states can be very resilient, particularly if they manage economic policy successfully. Ask yourself what it was that undid the Soviet Union and condemned Russia to a rather reluctant democratization. Economic failure has to be the best answer. A failure to manage the transition from a planned economy to a market economy was what undid Mikhail Gorbachev. And China's leaders look and have looked very closely at the Russian experience, and they don't want to go there. The lesson that they drew, and I don't think it's a bad lesson, is that you can either reform politically or reform economically, but to try and do both together is a recipe for chaos and political disintegration. And I think it's that fear of political disintegration which is so important uh, to China's leaders today and why they will resist very, very tenaciously any moves in the direction of representative government. It's, it's a fascinating question whether this ultimately will be forced upon them. Uh, there are those optimists who imagine democratic revolutions solving all our problems, not only in China, uh, but also spontaneously in Iran. I am not so optimistic. It seems to me that the Chinese model uh, has ample precedent, uh, and the lesson is clear. You can be an autocracy and a one-party state if you deliver economically. The moment you fail to will be the moment when demands for representation can't be ignored. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, a question for uh, the, both of you. Uh, I, I've noticed that the U.S. Current, foreign currency reserves appear to be depleting or have been completely depleted. According to the Federal Reserve, uh, in June they were, they were down to negative $83 billion. And my reading of the September Federal Reserve report has it that the, the report has omitted the, the, the figure of foreign currency reserve holdings. Uh, are, are either of you concerned about that imbalance? Because the Chinese have been estimated to hold 1.2 or 1.3 trillion dollars worth of foreign, you know, altogether foreign currency reserves. It, it, it strikes me as, uh, I mean, if we, if we were to suddenly uh, be, become dependent on foreign imports, more so than we are today, or if the price of oil were to go up to $100 or something. Uh, might we, uh, are we not in, in dire straits, the United States? That, that's the question. I, I can't think of anybody better qualified to answer that than you, actually. Uh, Richard Cooper, after all, has uh, more experience of American monetary policy than I, I your, shall ever have. Your, your question will send me scurrying off to look at my uh, Federal Reserve Bulletin because I'm not uh, familiar with the figure that you mentioned. Let me tell you what I think I know. Uh, it is entirely true that the U.S. foreign exchange reserves are low, and they have been forever. They are held not by the Federal Reserve, but by the U.S. Treasury, the Exchange Stabilization Account. Our big reserve is the gold in Fort Knox, which we don't touch for anything. It's just sitting there, and it would be more useful, actually, uh, sold to the electronics industry, in my, in my view. Uh, we do have several tens of billions of dollars worth of foreign exchange reserves, which were acquired some years ago, mostly in euros, some Japanese yen, some British pounds. And uh, they don't change very much. The reason is that we have accepted a floating exchange rate. So the U.S. authorities, uh, the Fed and the Treasury together, do not generally uh, intervene in the foreign exchange market. We do from time to time usually in cooperation with other countries and at the behest of other countries. For example, in the fall of 2001, that's already, believe it or not, six years ago, uh, 
we've cooperated with the new European Central Bank to, uh, to, to support the euro at that time. It was exceptionally low. It's not, now seems funny now because it's exceptionally high. But uh, general, generally speaking, the United States has not historically relied on foreign exchange reserves. And we, th there's nothing in our current or future plans to rely more on uh, foreign exchange reserves. We accept the dollar as it's determined in the marketplace. And it's determined in the marketplace by su supply and demand of basically of other countries, but of course including our own spending abroad. And uh, the dollar goes up, the dollar goes down. Uh, if there's more pressure of the type that you suggest, the dollar will go down some more. And we seem to be relaxed about that. Uh, U.S. manufacturers would actually welcome a weaker dollar. It would make their goods more competitive. Uh, U.S. travelers abroad, of course, would not like a weaker dollar because it means it's more expensive to travel. Uh, but basically, this country sells goods, services, and securities. Foreigners invest very heavily in this country, and that's what's been supporting the dollar for two decades now. It's a fascinating issue because when people look at numbers of the sort that you just cited, they, they often make the mistake of thinking that the United States is a Latin American economy. Now, there are reasons why you might make that mistake, but it's important to bear in mind that the United States is in a different situation from Latin American economies in the sense that it can borrow and pay for uh, imports in its own currency. Uh, it's in that happy position that a very small club of countries have uh, belonged to over the years. Uh, if you own an internationally accepted currency, you're in the happy position of being able to effectively print your own reserves, uh, print the money with which you pay for imported oil. And if, if oil goes up uh, to 100 or even $120 a barrel in a kind of nightmare geopolitical scenario of the sort we were talking about earlier, the U.S. isn't going to have to scrabble around uh, looking for dollars in, in its reserves. It, it can print some more if, if need be. I knew you were going to intervene at That's this not point. The right way to look at it. We don't. We don't print. We don't print our reserves. You have. To, you have to close the circle. You have to close the circle. If oil prices were to go up, oil exporters would be getting more money. Either they spend it or they invest it someplace. Where do they spend it? Where do they invest it? And if you look at financial markets around the world, the U.S. is far and away the easiest, the best in many dimensions place to invest the money. So when Saudi Arabia's reserves go up because of higher oil prices, they put most of it, not all of it, some goes into euros, some into other currencies perhaps, but most of it comes into dollars. But I think so the investment, a... the investment, we, our consumers, you and I pay more for our oil and the Saudi Arabians buy more U.S. securities and that's what closes the circle and keeps the dollar from falling. Indeed, it's generally been the case when prices, oil prices take a jump, the dollar strengthens rather than weakens, largely because of these financial reflows. The great question, though, Dick, is, is whether there's a sort of universal and eternal property that the dollar enjoys, that it will never, in a sense, fall into such disrepute that Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds will turn away uh, from investing in the United States. And it's worth bearing in mind that there must have been a time when People in London made this kind of argument about the pound sterling, that it will never cease to be uh, London to which uh, foreign investors look. And I think one of the interesting trends that one can identify if one takes the 100-year perspective is the trend whereby international reserve currencies come and go. They are not eternal. It is not written uh, in some stone tablet that the United States dollar will always be the dominant currency of the international system. Now, this brings us to a really important issue, and that is the phenomenon of sovereign wealth funds. These new players uh, that could account in a very short space of time for a very large percentage uh, of global investment, but which are nevertheless controlled by states, uh, Middle Eastern states, which, as you rightly say, are the other great surplus generators, but also Asian states, not only China, but small states like Singapore, which are nevertheless very wealthy. Their decisions about where they... Uh, invest their money, and the currencies they're prepared to hold will have profound consequences uh, for the global economy going forward. Uh, and it seems to me that many of those people would rather have some of the gold in Fort Knox than yet more uh, paper dollars, which, whether you like it or not, are produced by a process uh, of money creation, uh, of printing. This is one of the interesting questions that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finding myself pondering 
the higher the price of gold goes. At what point do Asians begin to balk at essentially accepting relatively low returns in non-dollar terms on their investments in the United States? Uh, the dollar has been sliding inexorably since I accepted a, a job at Harvard University. <laughs> it was one of the worst trades I ever made to accept tenure at Harvard, and I should have asked Larry Summers if he could hedge my contract in euros. Uh, but that inexorable trend, if it continues, and we don't know where the floor may be, will sooner or later cause the managers of these vast sums of money to say, maybe we're overweight the dollar. Maybe for all that the euro... Uh, has its disadvantages. We could use some more of those things. Uh, very stimulating comments from both you and the moderator, which uh, started me thinking that the uh, he mentioned the gold in Fort Knox. I believe it's also in the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, several several uh, layers down. Uh, but uh, it is uh, staying there doing nothing. But it was up until August 1971, it was not stagnant like that it was flowing out of the United States into the European, mostly, and other uh, nations of federal uh, central banks, causing Nixon in August of 71 to close the gold window. Since then, it's been stagnant. But since then, you've seen a deterioration of the dollar, and you've seen a gold price go from 35 or so, whatever it was, till 750 or so, which it is <coughs> today. And at that but aside from the gold price going up, you've had a deterioration in the value and exchange rate of the dollar, which is continuing. And you have China holding the, this vast amount of currency, which is deteriorating as, they, as we speak. And you also mentioned that the one child, I can couple that with the one child policy of China, has caused an abundance of males, I understand because of fem uh, a resurgence of female infanticide or the Chinese philosophy to want a male child in, uh, uh, in, in an imbalance. You have an excess of males. I understand there's also a shortage of brides uh, now in China. I've read uh, someplace or other. At any rate, with that male imbalance, a deteriorating foreign reserves, an, an economic power coming up, and you're an economic historian, you are a good one, and you're pessimistic, and I, I, I believe you've spread your pessimism. I, I, I was moderately pessimistic before I came here tonight, but now I'm beyond moderate. Moderation is uh, left at the we're post. Immoderately if we're a pessimistic. horse race, moderation is left at the post. Uh, but at any rate, China is also a vast power with intellectual, uh, intellectual reserves as well. And it's a nuclear power, and it... It has missiles and what have you. Do you uh, and that one-child policy? Do you and uh, you? You mentioned also that uh, natural resources are not infinite in their supply, and we have seen conflicts in the world uh, over uh, over uh, conflicts. I believe President Ford said that's the history of the world: nations fighting over when. You, what do you see? Me, the you potential have, you have conflict, somebody behind you, so uh, the ask potential your military conflict between the United States and China. Well, th thank you very much. You raised a whole range of different issues there that it's quite hard to, to, to relate to one another. Not at all. I, I, I think it's uh, important to acknowledge the extraordinary complexity of the historical process. Uh, of course, we can't look back uh, nostalgically to the days uh, of gold, or indeed the days of the Bretton Woods system when. Uh, the gold in, in, in Fort Knox played some kind of uh, function in the international monetary system. Uh, now, uh, both uh, Richard Cooper and I have written about the gold standard, and I don't think either of us uh, regret its passing. Indeed, it's quite interesting to imagine how the world economy would look if somehow uh, it had been possible to cling on to the gold standard. I, I certainly can't believe that economic growth would have been as high, though it might well be that we'd have avoided the inflationary uh, shock of the 1970s. The question of the surplus of, of males in China is an interesting one. There is some historical reason to believe uh, that having a lot of young men is bad for your political stability. Just to throw out an example, it was the oversupply of, of educated young men that commonly was seen as a cause uh, of the 1848 revolutions uh, in Europe. Uh, the, the question really is uh, whether these young men have time 
uh, given the uh, degree to which they are involved in economic activity, to contemplate any kind of political activity, uh, much less a sustained search for foreign brides. Uh, and it seems to me that the market will probably uh, address this problem more likely than conquest. So I think if we're fearing a, uh, a, an explosion of violence from the oversupply of, of Chinese men or perhaps a, a bid by Chinese males to acquire the gold of Fort Knox, we, should, we shouldn't worry. That's, that's not what I worry about. The place where you're likely to see conflict arising from those sorts of demographic uh, uh, problems is the Middle East, where you have uh, a relatively young uh, uh, male population uh, in economic difficulties with very, very limited economic uh, opportunities. It's young men, not just men. Remember, this Chinese population is aging relatively rapidly. You want young men unemployed with an ideological uh, fervor. All of those things are in place in the Middle East, and they certainly aren't in place in China. Thank goodness. Shall we take one more question, uh, Dick? Thank you for really illuminating discussion. Um, I'll make this really brief since I know we're running out of time. Just asking you for a couple of projections about, I guess, two of the things that are bothering me most about China. One is really the, uh, the, the lack, as you say, of rule of law and private property. I mean, who really owns the means of production in China? And are we going to see something akin to what happened in Russia, where basically people with political connections wind up owning the means of production? That's, that's one question. And the other, something you haven't raised, but something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, is the whole issue of the Chinese stock market and what I'm seeing as possibly a bubble. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, the, you know, the price of Chinese stocks are, are off the charts, I think, compared to what their value is. And, uh, you know, what might happen if um, all these new investors who are somewhat naive going, looking at screens in China, starting... Uh, uh, accounts and buying stocks just based on, you know, uh, charts going up, and if something were to happen, uh, what, what do you project might happen? Well, Thanks. projections like, like uh, the future have to be multiple. There are, there are multiple scenarios in both these cases. I think the really in interesting point is that there has formally been a change in China, so that the law has been changed. The basis exists for uh, a system of law based on private property, which wasn't the case before. Whether that has any reality on the ground remains to be seen, where it seems to me many decisions, and here I, uh, I speak as one who only uh, knows a little of China, but many decisions appear to be based uh, on regional party power. The degree to which the center doesn't really control regional party bosses is an extremely important phenomenon here. And the real nexus that drives China today is the nexus between regional party power and regional property development. Uh, and that property development seems to be going on with, uh, uh, with very li little regard to, say, the interests of, uh, of rural communities. And this is causing uh, well-documented uh, conflict, though this conflict is easily controlled by China's powerful police state. Uh, so it's a long way from being a reality. Uh, and private property rights are all very well to inscribe in law. But of course, they have to be, at some point, asserted uh, if, if private property had no previous existence, it's a, it's a grab, as it was in the Soviet Union. The grab in the Soviet Union was particularly egregious because the Yeltsin administration effectively handed away the most important assets uh, in the Soviet, uh, or rather the Russian economy, for a pittance in return for election backing to get Yeltsin re-elected. I can't imagine a scenario happening like that in China, uh, but there's nevertheless almost certain to be a concentration of wealth in politically powerful hands at the regional basis. And that can't be good for long-term uh, stability. As to your question about the Chinese stock market, well, I can only say this. There has never been a case of rapid Asian economic development that has not been punctuated by at least one major financial crisis. And I really don't buy the idea that China will somehow be the exception that proves this rule. And I think you ask the right question when you say, how will people react to a really major uh, sell-off when they are, in a sense, so new uh, to this particular game. On the other hand, bear in mind uh, that all of the, 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 the things that happen in Shanghai, as compared with Hong Kong, happen in what is, in effect, still a closed economy. Uh, Chinese investors are subject to capital controls. 
the, the average Chinese retail investor doesn't have the option uh, to take a position in the S&P 500. And it's an argument that, uh, that uh, Richard Cooper has made, which I find very compelling, that if you imagine a world in which those capital controls are gone, uh, then some of the imbalances we're talking about will, in fact, even out because there'll be a, a significant number of Chinese investors who would rather have their money in New York uh, than in Shanghai, where it will be subject clearly to much greater volatility, uh, as is true of all emerging markets. So one scenario down the line, which may be an appropriate uh, note on which to end, uh, is a benign one, because I don't like people who arrive pessimistic to leave even more pessimistic. There is a benign scenario for Chimerica. Uh, and the benign scenario is that, that the Chinese really mean it as they make a transition to a regime of private property rights. And they really mean it uh, in making a transition to free market uh, uh, arrangements in their capital markets. And if they do that, uh, not only will the investors be more secure when they invest money in China, but the United States will benefit from what will be a veritable wall of money. Indeed, I hesitate to say it, a great wall of money uh, emerging from China. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your attention.